Okay, well, so let's talk about musculoskeletal imaging. And what I'd like to do is go over some very basic anatomy real quickly, and then I'll talk for the first portion about imaging tools or the modalities we use in MSK, and these, these overlap quite a bit with uh, the other subspecialties. And feel free to interrupt me at any time and ask questions. Even though I'm recording this, I won't you know, try to be very formal. And then we'll go through some examples, and that'll last, like I said, around 45 minutes. And, um, and then we'll take a break and look at some, some cases. So by way of background, you know that the skeletal system is made up of the skeleton, all the bones of our skeletal system, all 206 of them. And of course, one of the tasks is to refresh our memories about what, what different bones are named and their different subparts. Um, within the bones, we have bone marrow. And it's tempting to think that the skeletal system is kind of a static part of our anatomy, but of course it's alive. And the life is not only within the the bone surfaces, the cortical bones and things, but, but particularly inside the bone where the bone marrow is housed. And this is relevant because many of the imaging tests and especially MRI give us a window into the, the bone marrow. And we can see different signal abnormalities within the marrow or we can see normal. And so it's worth remembering that in adults, uh, if you look at this micrograph of bone marrow, a lot of these you know, black dots and pink dots, those are different hematopoietic cells producing, you know, whatever, uh, red cells, platelets, and so on. Here's a, here's a trabeculae in the bone here, so that's bone. The white cells, what are those cells? Fat. So those are, those are uh, lipid-containing cells, and there's a lot of those. And as we become adults, our marrow tends to become more and more occupied with fat, um, because our hematopoietic system is pretty, uh, pretty mature, and you know, compared to children, where they use almost all their skeleton to produce their hematopoietic cells, as adults we don't need that big of a compartment anymore. So in adults we see a lot of fat in the marrow, and that becomes relevant for MRI. Connecting the the skeleton together are muscles and tendons, and one of the challenges in MSK is knowing all the different muscle names and knowing the relevant ones for sure, and the tendons that connect them to bone. Um, so when we think about things like injuries to the thigh in sports, especially like quadriceps muscle groups, hamstring muscle groups, and uh, need to know a fair amount of detailed anatomy up about those, and the injuries can occur in different specific areas. So we'll, uh, we'll see some examples of that later on. Moving on to ligaments, uh, sorry, this is more tendon. So um, when you talk about muscles, the tendons then go and connect the muscle to bone. So here's rotator cuff of the shoulder, inserting on the humerus here. You can see the biceps tendon coming up the arm and then inserting on the, in the upper part of the shoulder here. So we can look at all those things with MSK imaging. Ligaments connect bone to bone. Okay, so here's a knee, right? I'll give you that. So if there's a ligament that's on this outer part here, here's the fibula, what, what would that ligament be called? Yeah, LCL, and more specifically, this is, this is the fibular collateral ligament. We often will use the LCL a little bit more broadly to include other things like the biceps that's not shown here, or the IT band. And so the other compartment we look at in tissue is the articular cartilage, and these images, I have a few of these in here. These are from this Bassett collection, which is a Stanford uh, collection from anatomy from, the, from many years ago. And they're just beautiful images of like the knee articular cartilage. And this little cartoon shows the, the white being the <coughs> cartilage. And of course, that's the surface that we hopefully have in our joints that allows them to, to glide with pretty much no friction and with no catching and no pain, hopefully. And uh, one of the big issues in orthopedics and in medical care in general is, is arthritis and osteoarthritis, and that's degeneration of the cartilage. So we see all those things with MSK imaging, and um, we think about, well, what are the different tissues that we look at? And these are the players. So it's bone, bone marrow, muscles, tendons, and ligaments, cartilage. And, and much of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis in my practice is we look at either normal things or we look at normal things uh, you know, things that were recently normal that are now torn or deranged somehow, like fractures or torn ligaments or torn meniscus or cartilage de degeneration. 
And there is a certain, you know, a definite subset of what we do that involves oncology, like bone tumors and things. Um, but those are luckily fairly rare in the MSK system, at least primary bone tumors are. So we don't deal quite as much with that, but we deal with detailed anatomy and derangements of that anatomy. Um, so that's a quick review of anatomy and just some of the highlights of it. Um, so if we look at the tools next here, um, the goal of a radiologist is sort of to see through the body or at least see inside the body. And back in my childhood, we had these, these things that you could buy that were supposedly x-ray vision to let you see into people. Of course, that didn't really work, but now we have a lot better tools and um, certainly it's evolving quite rapidly so that we have new tools all the time. Um, I show this just because, you know, remembering back to like physics, uh, the visible light world that we live in is only a very small part of the whole EM spectrum. And um, there's this huge other range of electromagnetic radi radiation that's all around us. And, you know, whether it's like your cell phone or TV or, or radio or whatever, um, so we're just living in a very small part of that world and we're just you know, constantly being bombarded by other stuff. And so I put this in uh, because it's sometimes useful to think about, well, what, what is, where does the radiographic imaging you know, things stand on this spectrum? So radio waves are, are, are low energy waves all the way up to things like X-rays and gamma rays, higher energy and course we need to think about what's what's safe in the non-ionizing range versus the ionizing range when we think about applying this to patients so so that's what that's that's about and I'll show where these different things lie as we go through the tools of the trade so radiography or x-ray I'll go through these in more detail bone detail fractures the spaces between joints CT is cross-sectional x-ray good for bone detail not so good for soft tissues MR Great for cross-sectional imaging, soft tissue detail, fluid, bone marrow, all kinds of things. So, so the main two things we use in my practice are radiography and MR imaging. Third would be CT, but we also use ultrasound. Ultrasound doesn't penetrate through bones, but it can see soft tissues really well. And so it's useful in many applications. And then nuclear medicine, which you're going to hear about separately, is a really useful uh, kind of collaborative, correlative tool, very sensitive for different physiologies, but but not as much anatomic detail, uh, at least for things like the traditional bone scan. And another kind of conceptual thing is that what we're trying to achieve to see different things is you want image contrast. So on radiography or x-ray, you have good contrast between bone and what's not bone, but in that what's not bone, you don't have very good contrast, right? So you don't see the, the planes between muscles and fat very well. You don't see ligaments um, or tendons. On MRI, you see all those things. So, you know, similar like sagittal view of the knee, you see inside the bone, you see ligaments, you see fluid and all that. So they're, they're complementary techniques. So radiography fits up here in the spectrum. It's, um, it's a fairly high energy type of a examination and it is ionizing radiation. So at, at normal medical doses, we don't think that it uh, poses a risk compared to the benefits that it, that it gives us. Um, but one needs to be conscious of that, particularly when using things like CT, which can uh, produce quite a bit of radiation. Um, and radiography is really useful. It's, it's widely available throughout the world, um, you know, even at Levi's Stadium, we have an x-ray machine and uh, looking, at, looking at bones. And it's, it's really useful for looking at high contrast stru structures. It's limited because it's a projection technique. It's taking 3D anatomy and just projecting it onto a two-dimensional plate, two-dimensional surface. And it doesn't really depict soft tissue that well. You know, if you have something like lung versus abdomen, that's a lot of contrast there or see the bones real well. But within the abdomen, you don't see much. Um, so that's a limitation. A radiographic exam might be something like this. And, and some of you may have had this done if you had an injury or pain somewhere. Um, this example, this is a digital detector here. Patient's positioned with a visible light where the uh, x-ray beam is going to go in the same place. And so you can position without radiating the patient other than with light. 
and then shoot the x-ray. It goes to the detector and then to a computer, and you generate a picture that might look like this, where you're looking at the shoulder, humerus, scapula, clavicle, acromion here. And each exam will have multiple different views to it. Like one view is no view, we often say that. So getting different projections just to kind of read better display that three-dimensional anatomy um, to us to make a diagnosis. So here's an example case. So here's, um, here's a hand, right? And does anybody see anything abnormal about this, this patient's hand? Any obvious injury? It was like trauma and pain. It's a little bit like the ro rotated position, you mean? Um, they're pretty good. Um, any of the fingers look like they might be more pudgy or swollen to the other. This says PA second digit. So somebody put on the, on the image like the second digit, which is the index finger, looks a little bit thicker. Well, let me cut to the quick here because this is really just to show an example of the limitations of projection, right? So same patient, you do the lateral view, that PIP joint is dislocated. And if you look at the PA view, since we're like projecting in the opposite plane, you can't see it. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, a simple example of why one of the limitations of radiography. But radiography is great for bone detail. So if there's a question about fracture, um, radiography x-ray is a great test to do and it's relatively inexpensive um, cadaver bone here or specimen bone you can see, see this cut specimen has the trabeculae within it and with a good quality x-ray you can actually see the trabecular pattern within bone and kind of analyze that as well as the cortical surfaces and look for things like fractures or focal lesions so easy example right Tony Romo, right, last week snapped his co collarbone in a, in a game. This is not uh, Tony Romo, but something like this could have happened. Easy to see this fracture. That's enough to make the diagnosis, enough to help determine treatment, you know, typically, for something like that. When you get to things like the uh, abdomen and pelvis, the, the overlying soft tissues can interfere with things. So here's a pelvic radiograph. And let's say the patient had pain in the sacral region. Well, we can see the sacrum in here and you see the iliac bones and so on, but there's a lot of gas and soft tissue that overlies that. So it's pretty tricky to see the sacrum. And this is a common situation that comes up in the emergency room. It's like um, car crash or a patient with a fall. Do they have a pelvic fracture? And we know how limited the radiography is just because we just don't see that area very well. And this, this sort of motivates why we do, why we have CT. So CT uh, is a cross-sectional imaging technique, and I don't go into the detail much, but the essence of it is that you have a, a table that the patient lies on, and you have the scanner with what's called the gantry here, the place that the patient goes through and translates through. And you have an X-ray tube around a ring, and the tube projects across the patient here, this, this circle, to a detector. And basically, the tube spins around, so you get a cross-sectional X-ray with a very thin beam. And that's not new technology, that's been around since the 70s, um, but it's evolved very, very rapidly into a much faster um, imaging modality than it used to be. And I'll show another example of that in a minute. So radiography and CT are up here in this kind of higher energy range of the spectrum um, ionizing radiation. It's cross-sectional, it's much better for soft tissues and it's still good for bone, just like X-ray is. When you're examining the abdomen, giving a bolus of intravenous contrast that'll go into things like the aorta and the kidneys and liver helps further differentiate those soft tissues based on their, their blood flow and the contrast enhancement. So that, that makes another significant difference. But so it, it's great for abdominal imaging and body imaging in general. This is just scrolling through an abdominal CT and it's not really the focus of this talk here, but as you see it go from the diaphragm all the way to the, through the pelvis here, this is approximately the, the speed at which a CT is now acquired. Um, back when I trained, it would take about two seconds per slice to get a CT image. You say, patient, take in a breath and hold it. Breathe. 
and then and over and over and so you'd have to do like 50 slices and that and so there's misregistration between the slices nowadays we have helical ct uh you know for the last geez i guess 20 years now one breath hold taking a breath and hold it bzzz, all the way down so that that influences things like the timing of the the intravenous contrast injection and and things like that that's that's outside the realm of this talk but but it's basically amazing how cool CT is now and how much it's evolved. The big advantage of it over radiography is like, here's the x-ray again, and let's say you, know, you, you wanna see this area. You do a CT scan across that plane and, and, and then you can see the cross-sectional bone detail much better. You're separating out the soft tissue and gas and everything from the bones that you want to see. So, so CT is used um, quite a bit in MSK for things like characterizing fractures, looking at complex fractures, dislocations, sometimes for tumors, but it's not really the primary imaging modality that we use um, because it's really good for bone, but it's not quite as good as MR for soft tissues. So that's why it's not more pervasive. But if the situation is again, that patient in the emergency room that fell, and if there's a high index of suspicion for a fracture, and one doesn't see something on the x-ray, then CT is a good next step because it's fast and it's very accurate for detecting fractures. Um, one of the reasons I'm in radiology is because I, I love the technology, right? And this, this just illustrates the quality of reformatted images we could get back in like 1996, where the slice thickness on a CT, you know, maybe it was still like two millimeters or so, or one millimeter, but just the imaging chain was not nearly as good as it is. And then we, we had what's called spiral helical CT with thinner slices and better reformations, and even better, more detectors, thinner slices. So these might be like 0.5 millimeter slices all stacked up in the coronal plane. So it can create images in almost an arbitrary plane now um, with about the same amount of radiation, but with, with much faster acquisition and this is even a decade ago things are are faster and thinner slices than that now um, but similar quality so for things like the wrist you know it can be advantageous to obtain the data in a transverse plane so you know it's going to be like you know per perpendicular to the wrist bones but then we stack those up and reformat them so that you can see the relevant anatomy so in this one in this example this space is really widened um, and the patient's uh, a pediatric patient. You can see the physes are still open here. The abnormality in this, in this example is, this is the scaphoid region here. This would be the lunate and the triquetrum. This space is too wide, and that ligament's probably uh, disrupted there. And it's partly because this patient had like developmental fusion of these bones, the lunotriquetral bone are fused and the scaphoids fused here like in a developmental anomaly that probably put extra strain on that articulation. And I'll just let this play. This is, this is CT data that is rendered with uh, 3D computer graphics. So this patient was scanned like from the upper chest down through the legs. And this company called Fovia has a great uh, 3D render, rendering engine that allows you to slice through the data and see different organs and things. And one of the things I worked on a lot in my earlier part of my career was flying into and through data. So in this patient, we're actually gonna fly into the trachea here and just CT data, but with advanced computer graphics, be able to like do a virtual endoscopy. Um, and so you can imagine the potential value of this sort of thing, just from a routine clinical examination that allows you to see things in ways that were otherwise um, never possible. In orthopedics, we use that for practical things like pelvic fractures. The orthopedic trauma surgeons like us to generate these types of images where we disarticulate the pelvis electronically and then can show fractures from the inside uh, perspective of the pelvis and then from the outside perspective. So here's like the acetabulum here, fracture here, fracture going through the acetabulum. And that helps them think through how they might recon 
uh, repair this, put plates on it, reduce the fracture fragments. It's also uh, useful for patients. You know, you can intuitively see something like this much easier than you could see um, the cross-sectional scans. Moving on, MRI. Um, MRI is terrific technology, and the advance in that that's so important is um, moving to higher magnetic field strengths. We've been operating at about 1.5 Tesla for the last about 20 years, and now things have moved towards three Tesla magnets. Um, it's not revolutionary, it's evolutionary, but it produces better quality images um, and probably higher diagnostic confidence that way. This is radio frequency energy, so it's much lower energy going into the patient. It's non-ionizing, cross-sectional with arbitrary scan planes, great contrast. Um, it's sensitive to motion, so that's good and bad. One thing is if the patient moves during the scan, it's, uh, it can blur the images or cause artifacts. But that motion sensitivity is also why it's good to see things like flowing blood or water diffusion. And so there's special techniques that you'll hear about that are looking for, for those sorts of physiological uh, parameters. So MRI is way down here in the low energy non-ionizing um, end of the spectrum. You know, the wavelengths are very long, um, you know, like on the order of buildings or the size of people. Scanner might look something like this, and it's a longer tube than the CT scanner. To, be, um, to get an MRI, most exams require a special radio frequency coil to put, be put around the, the joint of interest or body part of interest. So here's a patient getting a knee scanned radio frequency coil and this, this, this patient will slide into the middle of the magnet there, so he's in the main magnetic field. Then the radio frequency coil will transmit as well as receive the signal from the tissues that have been polarized by the main magnet. Okay. And so once again, in MRI, the goal is to, is to create contrast between different tissues, between um, articular cartilage, this gray here, and fluid, between the meniscus and fluid, and between bone, bone marrow, ligaments, and things like that. So another example. So here's, here's x-ray or radiography. There's sort of uh, four densities that we can see with radiography um, from highest to low. So one would be bone. So all the bone is this white right in the shoulder. The second one is, is true soft tissue, like the muscles along here. The third one is fat density, so a little bit lower signal or density there. And then the fourth would be gas, like air within the lung or outside the patient. And then you might have something extraneous, like a clip here, or a, a snap on the gown. That's metal, so that's a fifth density. But, but basically, within this soft tissue compartment here, if you will, that's anything that's actually soft tissue, like a solid organ or a muscle or a tendon, and fluid. Fluid's the same density. So you can't tell fluid from, from soft tissue on radiography. Whereas MRI, you see very distinct contrast between those tissues. So here's a shoulder again, here's the glenoid, here's the humeral head, here's muscle in here. So this would be the, the supraspinatus muscle coming out to tendon that you see is lower signal here, inserting on the bone, sorry, um, inserting on the bone. And then you also see the fat signal here. So the white on this MRI scan is, is fat, and so all this white inside the bone, that's the fat that's in the marrow. And that's normal for an adult. And I'll show examples of why this is important in a minute. So tremendous image contrast, very good, good diagnostic quality because of that. So if we do an MRI scan, let's say the knee, we'll do different so-called pulse sequences. And this is the, you know, the, the, series, the sort of set of pictures that's obtained in one scan. So for example, if you get a knee MRI done here at Stanford, we'll do five sequences. And there's like two sagittal plane, two coronal plane, and one transverse axial plane. These are two axials in this example. One's called a T1 weighted image, and one's called proton density fat suppression. Um, sometimes we do what's called T2 with fat suppression. But you can see the dramatic differences in contrast here. So, so our goal when we're designing designing a protocol to image a particular joint is to say, you know, what anatomy do we want to see? What tissues do we need to see? 
and, and, and what things do we need to complement one another. So here you can see on this T1, all the fat's like really bright and you see really good contrast between that fat and things like muscle here. On this image, you see really good contrast between the fat that's been made black by fat suppression here and the fluid. And so what we're really looking for here is articular cartilage. And so this, this illustration shows that. So T1 weighted image, take a look at the patella here, this gray along here, that's the articular cartilage. And you really can't tell much about it on that sequence because the fluid that's in the joint is the same signal as the cartilage. If I turn that into a proton density weighted image, you can see these white lines. That's actually fissuring in the cartilage, it's cartilage damage that you can see much better because of that manipulation of contrast, okay? So that's kind of the, the broader rationale behind these different pulse sequences that we use. Often we will think of these, these kind of sequences where fluid is very bright as just like, uh, quote, fluid sensitive sequences, because a lot of pathology that occurs, whether it's like effusions, soft tissue edema, hematoma, turn out to be bright on these, so it's like fluid sensitive. And then the T1 weighted images are probably better for anatomy, uh, you know, compartmentalization of things. They do show pathology, but not quite as well. So again, we, we complement these with each other when we do the uh, scans. Question? Go ahead. Well, they both show both. So if I go back to this. I'm wondering what the second one is. What specifically the contrast goes to for both of those options. Right. So the T1 or T2 weighting of an MRI scan has to do with um, what's called the relaxation time of the water uh, molecule. Exactly what's happening with the fat. Uh, you're, you're answering my question. Okay, good. So it's like a weighting, a weighting of those different, those different um, actually biophysical properties of the of the things. So, but just sort of operationally, you can think of a T1 weighted image usually as showing the fat and 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 contrast real well versus the T2 is showing fluid a lot better. Let's see. So. That would be the wrong way. Let me go back this way. Ultrasound. Okay, so this is a little dog having an ultrasound. This my dog had an ultrasound fairly recently too, and it was like cost me like 500 bucks. But I'd have to be HIPAA compliant here, right? So um, it is useful in veterinary medicine. Um, no radiation. So obviously, it's used for things like uh, imaging the pregnant uterus and all kinds of other things and uh, uses sound waves, very safe. Um, it's great for uh, soft tissues and it's great for fluid because the sound waves penetrate through fluid very, very well. So if you're trying to get into the skull, you can't really do that because it bounces off the bone. If you're, if you're an infant, we have the fontanelles and you can actually see through the fontanelles into the brain and we use that for pediatric imaging to look for things like um, Intraventric, in, intraventricular hemorrhage in, uh, in infants and neonates. It's portable. The machines can be um, wheeled around or carried around, and you know it's, it's, a, it's a growing field. So this doesn't use really electromagnetic radiation. It uses sound waves, and it's at the higher frequency end of things. It's above, it's ultra, right, above what we can typically hear. Fortunately, otherwise, the ultrasound lab would be pretty noisy. Um, you need that acoustic window. It's got some cool features like it's real time. It's very fast image reconstruction and acquisition. So you like sweep along and you can see what's going on. And you can use the Doppler properties of, of tissues moving away or fluid moving away or towards the probe to get color flow information. So here's fetal ultrasound, looking at the umbilical cord, kidney, kidney showing color Doppler energy imaging, showing blood flow into the kidney. Um, abdominal pelvic applications. In MSK, we use it for things like, um, we use it for to guide a lot of procedures actually, but it's, it's really good for cysts, for example. So here's a patient imaging of the foot. So here's a T1 weighted scan and then a T2 weighted scan. 
and this white lobular thing is called a ganglion cyst that's coming out between bones here. And this patient had pain in the forefoot. It was one of our uh, women's basketball players many years ago. And we used the ultrasound not to like diagnose this cyst, but to use it to guide uh, a needle going into it to, to drain that cyst. And I'll talk a little bit more about procedures in a minute here. So on this image, the, the probe would be on the skin surface at the top of the image. The bone would be this white interface here. And then you can see the cyst protruding out of the bone here um, real nicely. And it's easy to use ultrasound to guide a needle into that to help drain that type of thing. It it can and and in this in in cystic structures like fluid filled structures they have something called through transmission and so the sound I don't remember if it goes faster through the cyst uh, or what but when you don't have in this example you actually have bone right backing this up so if this cyst was just in fluid you'd actually see kind of quote a shadow behind it that would tell you yeah there's increased through tra transmission and that means it's cystic as opposed to solid. So the, there is a value in that, that imaging feature. The other thing one can do is if you have this and, and you're trying to decide solid versus cystic is how, how uniform does it look internally? Does it look like it's heterogeneous? Or you turn on color flow and if something has vessels within it, then you know that it's, that it's solid as opposed to cystic. That's used a lot for things like cystic versus solid, like renal lesions, kidney lesions, like is this a cyst or is this a solid tumor in the kidneys because the kidneys get a lot of cysts in them. Um, nuclear medicine is the last uh, technology that I'll just mention. Um, it does use ionizing radiation, but the big difference here, of course, is that the, the, the tracers are administered to the patient, right? Intravenous injection of a bone scan tracer or um, sodium fluoride for a PET scan or glucose for a PET scan or Sestamibi for a cardiac scan, all these different molecular specific tracers that are radioactive and then they emit radiation and it's detected by some detector, you know, sort of a, a gamma camera, like a Geiger counter sort of thing, but a camera. And so this patient's having a bone scan and um, technologist is sit standing here um, and so, you know, it's safe to be within distance of this patient here. So he's, he's, he's quote, radioactive, but, you know, we say like glowing in the dark. It's not that bad, right? But um, so it's not insignificant, but it's not enough to worry about neighboring techs, for example. But, so there's a detector up above and then there's a detector below, too, because the, the, the radiation is coming out both directions. It is true, say this was a pregnant patient here who you know, we wouldn't, we try not to do a bone scan on them because of the radiation, but if someone was nursing a baby, then there could be some radiation in the breast milk. So we'd say, you know, discard the breast milk for 24 hours so that the, the, your baby doesn't get any of the, um, the radiation. So again, nuclear medicine, those techniques are up in the high energy end of the spectrum in the x-ray range and even higher up into the gamma, gamma range, but the doses tend to be um, fairly low. So here's an example of a bone scan. And the, the, the uh, photons don't travel that far. I guess they travel far, but they, don't, they, they disperse fairly quickly. So, so an anterior view like this one is not the same as a posterior view, okay? Because it's so from the different detectors because of this, this dispersion. In the bones, magnesium diphosphonate acts as like... Um, like like uh, phosphorus, and um, so within our bones, that goes to areas where there's um, you know calcium phosphate um, uh, mineral, and it takes a little while for it to be taken up, like four to six hours. It starts immediately, but then it accumulates, and then it'll disperse. So this scan would be done a couple of hours after the injection, and you can faintly see this patient's kidneys. Here's the urinary bladder here. Um, this blob here on the arm. That's where the injection was done into the uh, antecubital region. 
and it's inevitable almost that you get a little tiny bit of the tracer right outside the vein. So that's a normal bone scan. <clears throat> this one is not normal. And so here's a lower portion of the abdomen and pelvis, and there's increased tracer activity here. This would be the right side. And this gets to the pros and cons of a bone scan. It's, it's very high activity, and, but it's not very specific as far as what it is. This could be a tumor, it could be infection, it could be a stress injury to bone, and without good clinical context, you may not know which, which of those things it is. If it's a stress injury, like an overuse injury, can't tell on a bone scan whether it's a fracture or not. Um, so, so it's extremely sensitive, very useful for things like screening for metastatic lesions in bone, um, looking at bone tumors, somewhat for stress injuries. Um, but MRI has taken over a lot of what nuclear medicine used to do, at least in the bone scan world. Okay, so that's like a quick tour of the modalities. I'm happy to um, stop and take any questions at this point. And keep going. Okay. Okay, good. Well, hopefully that's helpful. I know it's probably somewhat redundant, but I like to try to just frame it up a little bit for you. So let's just buzz through some examples here and um, try to give you a little bit of a <clears throat> perspective on you know, what sort of things we look for. So in the knee, um, the task of a MSK radiologist or orthopedic surgeon, whoever's you know, looking at these images, is you know, what's normal, what's not. So this like sort of normal, abnormal, is like the best case example of you know, how, to, how to see something that's not normal. Anterior cruciate ligament, right? And so here's femur, tibia, patella, okay? And so here's the anterior cruciate ligament coming off the femur here, coming down and attaching to the tibia here. On this example, you see part of it up here, and then there's a big gap here, and then that's there. So that's obviously a big tear. We just see part of the posterior cruciate ligament here because remember these are these are sections. They're about two two to three millimeters thick. So you'd have to go to the neighboring sections to see the other parts of that ligament. And in a minute, I'll go through a, a scan here in a stack mode so you can see those things better. So that's pretty easy to diagnose, right? And when we have patients that have knee trauma, um, depending on the clinical scenario, like in sports imaging, knowing whether somebody's got an ACL tear or not is very important. Um, but the orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine folks are actually pretty good at diagnosing the ACL tears clinically or by the mechanism. So a lot of the job of the MRI is not so much to confirm the uh, ligament tear, but it's to look for other stuff that happened that can influence the prognosis and treatment of the patient. Again, we use different pulse sequences for different things. So here's, here's that same sagittal image on a patient with a torn ACL. This image, same patient, but a different pulse sequence. So this is a fluid sensitive sequence. And the other thing that I haven't emphasized is if you, if you do this image in one way, the fat stays very bright. But what we do is we apply a special radio frequency pulse to make the fat signal go away. And you can do that on a T1-weighted image, or you can do it on a T2-weighted image. The reason to do it is because if you have bright fat here and you have this bright white area there, you don't have enough contrast to see that. So what this fat suppression does is it gets rid of the signal from the normal fat, but it makes things like this, which is a bone contusion, a bone bruise, very conspicuous. And so these two images very much go together in the sense that when people tear their ACL, usually the tibia draws anteriorly like this, and the back part of the tibia hits on this part of the femur. So you get contact between the two bones, and you actually get bruising within the bone, just like you can get a bruise you know, subcutaneously or whatever. The bone gets bruised, and in more advanced cases, it can actually fracture the bone. But we know these different patterns are fairly pathognomonic. In other words, this bone bruised pattern in the lateral compartment of the knee is very prototypical of the type of mechanism you have when you when you tear an ACL. So if we see this pattern, we know look you know really carefully at the ACL for tear. Now I have a few videos here, including of somebody uh, tearing their ACL, and so I have a whole collection of videos that I won't show many of, but they're very from being like 
easy to take to being pretty gory. So I have this rating system, okay? So G is for general audiences, anybody can take that. PG is like mildly gory injury. PG-13 is like moderately gory. That's sort of where, you know, different people in the, in the class may kind of go, ooh, that's nasty. Um, R is really gory injury, where none of us really like to see that sort of thing. Um, I don't think I have any rated R stuff in here. And then rated X is egregious violence or somehow Snooki or Paris Hilton's involved or something like that. And I have, I have nothing like that. I have to come up with a new, every year I have to come up with a new person or somebody to put in that, you know, that, that Paris Hilton's probably a good, she's like a frequent flyer. Or, <laughs> Brett Favre was in there a few years ago, um, usually for some sort of ind indiscretion. This one's like moderately gory. It's it's not too bad, but I I think it'll just start to loop automatically here. But we're gonna see um, <clears throat> it do, it doesn't loop. Some of them I couldn't quite fix, so they wouldn't. This this basketball player. It's an old video. It's a little blocky. She's gonna come down on her right knee, I think, and and it the foot's planted on the floor. It externally rotates a bit, and then she has like a valgus mechanism in the knee, and you can tell that it's an injury for her, um, and but this is a pretty typical mechanism for an ACL. This video, God, it must be 15 years ago. This is at University of Washington in Seattle where I trained, actually, uh, at least medical school. Heck, Ed Pavilion is like empty, you know, back then in this women's game. Um, it, it would now be obviously much, much fuller, but um, this is from the UW orthopedics site. Um, so she comes down, plants that knee, the foot, externally rotates some and there's a valgus stress and that's that's enough of a force in her with the foot staying fixed to the ground to twist the knee enough to stretch the ACL typically like almost twice its normal length and then to pop it and a lot of times when people do that they 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 feel a pop and there can be an audible pop as well and even sometimes people that are right around them hear the pop as well so why is that important? Well, the main importance is that we don't always see the, uh, we don't always have video, although more and more we do, it seems like. But if we see these biomechanical footprints on the MRI, we can kind of back construct the injury. So we see this all the time. It's like, oh, that bone bruise pattern looks like a hyperextension injury. Or this, this bone bruise pattern looks like the patient had a patellar dislocation. Many things that may not be clinically evident um, or the patient may not remember, or, you know, I, I work a lot with the sports teams and I'll say to the guys, like, you know, what happened? And they're like, I don't know, man, I got rolled up on and I just felt this pop, you know, and so you can kind of back reconstruct things from the MRI, the bone bruises going with the ACL tear. <clears throat> okay, so quiz mode, coronal image of the knee, right? So a front view, um, I'll give you this. This is lateral and this is medial. So this one is normal. So the question is, what is this structure here in a mid-coronal image? That's at, it's abnormal on this image. Different patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, excellent. MCL. So this is a normal medial collateral ligament. See how beautifully it's seen nice and dark going from the femur down to the tibia. This one is partially torn, and this is a T1-weighted image, so it doesn't show you the bright fluid, but it shows you the thickening and kind of heterogeneity in that ligament that occurs you know, after it's been torn, and in this case, starting to scar a little bit. The ACL in this patient is this band right here. Again, we're just seeing like a slice of it, not the whole thing. The PCL's here. You can see the, the knee menisci or these triangular structures. We'll look at those again in a moment. So here's menisci on a cadaver, um, you know, cut away the femur. Here's the lateral meniscus, this kind of golden thing that's got a thin edge to it, thicker in the periphery, medial meniscus. So if we were to take a slice through here, like in a sagittal plane, it'll cut these triangular cross sections of the meniscus, and it would also be triangular if we cut it this way, maybe a little curved, but triangular. So here's normal medial meniscus, anterior horn, posterior horn, thinner in the middle there. And then here's a tear where the rule is to call a tear, what you have to see is increased signal, this signal here, going to one of the surfaces of the meniscus. 
So the articular surfaces are these, this part like of the meniscus here or here that's, that's against the cartilage. There's the base of the meniscus here as well. And that part in the base where it's fixed to the capsule and stuff, that doesn't qualify as a tear if it goes there. I mean, it, there's, there's subtleties to this, but a tear is where it goes to the articular surface. Here's another patient, pretty normal menisci. Here's what's called a proton density weighted image and then a T2 fat suppressed image. Menisci are pretty normal, nice sharp triangles without any bright signal going to the surfaces, but his cartilage is degenerated. So this gray, this is articular cartilage along the femur, tibia, and you see the white stuff going in there, a little bit of bone signal within it uh, next to it. That's cartilage degeneration. That's, that's basically osteoarthritis starting to form. Now, when we read these things, and I'll show an example when we show some cases, is what we do is we have them all stacked together, right? And we have them on our packs, and we scroll back and forth. So if you look at this, this is the lateral um, part of the knee here, lateral meniscus. The medial is here where you have this signal below the bone. This is a little bit of like fibrosis or edema in the bone next to this cartilage degeneration. As I scroll, you can see the irregularity here, a little bit of extra bone. But basically, we're looking at you know, different structures as they come in and out of plane here to try to make diagnoses in, in kind of that third dimension as well, and also to see things lay out. So this is the anterior cruciate ligament here, and as you come forward, it kind of fans out. As you go backwards, you can see it going up, and it's coming off the, the femur up here. So that, again, just kind of conceptually, how do we look at, how do we look at scans? This is a younger patient who had a dislocated patella. So the, here's the axial scan. Here's the patella here, the kneecap, right? Patella usually dislocates laterally. And so this bone transiently was way out here. And it's relocated, which it usually does as you extend the knee, but he shaved off this big chunk of cartilage here. And so that's like a really important thing for us to detect because that may be the difference between this patient getting surgery or not. So a displaced fragment of cartilage from a patellar dislocation. A little bit on shoulder. Who's this cat? Tim Lincecum. Very good. He's, uh, he's, he's uh, been a tremendous giant. He, uh, he just had his own orthopedic surgery a few weeks ago, right? He got his hip, hip, uh, hip scoped. Um, but he's a good example of shoulder because uh, not because he's been injured, but because of this tremendous range of motion that we have in our shoulders that allow us to do things like, you know, pitch a 95 mile an hour fastball or something like do this circumduction of the, the shoulder. And the, the reason we can do this, right, is because the socket is so shallow. So if you look at the glenoid here and the humeral head, the glenoid is really pretty flat compared to the hip, you know, deep socket, very hard to dislocate the hip, but inherently the shoulder is unstable if you don't have surrounding, um, you know, capsule, ligaments, and um, labrum, and rotator cuff. So when we look at radiographs of the shoulder, you have the different um, parts, right? So just focusing on the glenoid and the humeral head here, on this view, it's sort of likened to a golf ball on a tee, where the head is like a golf ball and the glenoid face, it's like the tee. You know, it's almost ready to fall off. That's what gives you this great range of motion, um, but it also kind of promotes the potential for instability. So what happens? So the rotator cuff muscles surrounding the back and in the in, sorry in the front and in the back are a cuff around our shoulder. And so what are the four different rotator cuff muscles? Right, good. They're yeah, they're labeled so supra sup, sits S I T S right supraspinatus infraspinatus according to the scapular spine, and then and then the further in the back the teres minor a smaller cont contribution, and then in the front the subscapularis under the scapula muscle. The biggest one that gets torn is the supraspinatus tendon, and I'll show an example of that in just a minute. So an MRI again it's great for the rotator cuff. So here's T1 weighted image, fluid sensitive image. This gray, that's the supraspinatus muscle belly, and it's forming into this darker black structure. That's the tendon there. 
The tendon doesn't have much fluid in it normally, so it's nice and dark on MRI, just kind of like cortical bone. And so a normal cuff should be continuous tendon that's smooth without any white lines in it. Now there's a little bit of lighter signal right here. That's like a that's a known imaging artifact, but that's a pretty normal rotator cuff. This one is not normal. Okay, so supraspinatus, T1, the tendon comes out, it's not black anymore. It's kind of gray, maybe it's a little thicker. And on the fluid sensitive sequence, see this white going right through there? That's fluid going through the rotator cuff, so that's a full thickness rotator cuff tear. In terms of stability, the labrum is something that makes the socket deeper. So the labrum is like the knee meniscus. It's a cartilage, fibrocartilage structure around the perimeter of the labrum, of the uh, glenoid, and it deepens the socket. So that helps stabilize our shoulder. That structure can be torn and detached, and then if that happens, you know, you can have more instability and sequelae of that. So again, a cadaver specimen here, looking into the glenoid fossa after the humerus has been removed. The labrum is this structure right in here, this pretty narrow structure. The biceps tendon comes in there. And if you do an MR image crossways like this, you'll see something like this anatomy. So in this is a transverse scan. So this is anterior, posterior, humeral head, glenoid. The labrum is this little triangular thing right here. The capsules here, this is part of like the subscapularis muscle and tendon. But in this one, you see the labrum, it's undercut by a little bit of the gray, which is cartilage, but you don't see any white lines going through it. This is that same example here. So here's normal labrum, this little triangle here with capsule, labrum, and this one is torn. So this is in the back, the posterior labral tear or detachment, but that white going through there, that's torn, that's, that's been detached. And that could be because this patient had a previous just injury, or they may have had a dislocation, um, or maybe they're having recurrent dislocations. Most often the labrum is torn anterior and inferiorly because that's where people dislocate, right? A um, couple little other compartments here, and then we'll be done with this part. Um, stress injuries. So this is overuse injury to bone, and um, we have a lot of that at Stanford because uh, in the community in general, because everybody tends to be active or Many people tend to be active. Um, we have tremendous athletics teams, as I think you all know, and the cross country and track and field. Um, and some of these young athletes, they're running you know, hundreds of miles a week or more than 100 miles a week, and they're, they're ramping up their activity and prone to get stress injuries to bone. So MRI is really good for detecting that or excluding it. And one may see something like this. Um, this is a pretty big stress injury. This is um, several years ago, but it was a younger, about a 22-year-old male, cross-country runner, sacral pain. So this is the right side, left side. And this is a fracture line going through the sacrum. This dark line, it's actually the fracture surrounded by edema. That's a big sacral stress fracture. And the thing about stress fractures is, you know, they're insidious in onset. So it's like repetitive microtrauma. It's not like one event, like getting hit by a bus or something. It's like, Oh, over the course of months while I was training, I started to have this pain. Now it hurts when I walk or when I run or when I hop on it. And so they're incomplete fractures, typically. It's, it, luckily, you don't get a complete fracture very often. Um, and so they can be treated conservatively. Um, we just had one of these last week that was much, much smaller than this. It was only about a centimeter in size with a tiny little fracture component in one of our female cross-country runners but the MRI is really good for diagnosing that. This is the same patient that I showed that bone scan on before that has that big black dot in the, in the right SI joint. And the, so the bone scan was positive, stress injury, but is it stress reaction, stress fracture? We don't really know. The MRI is very, very particular about that diagnosis. Um, metatarsals, so, um, you know, going, going forward to this image, <clears throat> If you have somebody with foot pain, you think maybe they have a stress fracture in the foot, getting radiographs is a really good idea. Now, they may well be normal because the injury to the bone can be too subtle to see until it starts to remodel. But if you get radiographs and they're normal and you can reasonably kind of rest the patient for a week or two and you get follow-up films, that'll often show a stress injury that wasn't visible that then becomes radiographically apparent 
And for most of us, that's that's a reasonable way to manage a patient, right? Depending on where the injury is and what the risk is. So this was a patient, this is two weeks after the MRI that I'll go back to. This is eight weeks after it's healing up pretty nicely. Um, but the MRI can diagnose it even when the x-rays are normal. So that's why, you know, if you were to go to the doctor and say, geez, I've been running a lot. I think I have a, maybe I have a stress injury. You may get normal x-rays. They say, well, let's get an MRI. Um, MRI definitely shows you much more than the x-ray. It's expensive, not trivial to, you know, to get it done, but it's very valuable depending on the patient situation, um, you know, and the need to know and stuff like that. So T1, fluid sensitive, T2 fat sat here. This fourth metatarsal, see the whole bone is like darker in signal. This whole bone is white here. That's all edema within the bone. There's some surrounding edema. That dark line there, that's the fracture line. Um, and at this point in time, it still may be not visible on an x-ray. So that's a metatarsal stress fracture. <clears throat> um, this last couple of slides is just to say that we don't just sit around and read x-rays and MRIs. We do quite a few procedures as well. And um, that's what makes my job fun is because, um, you know, you can definitely be kind of behind the scenes as a radiologist, but I like patient contact and to be able to do um, procedure. So we do all kinds of different joint injections, things like shoulder, elbow, wrist. Um, some of those we do because we're trying to make the scan better, like for an MR arthrogram, we'll inject MRI contrast, dilute MRI contrast into a joint to like distend the joint out. We may also inject some anesthetic at that time to do like a pain block. Um, or we're doing it to inject some steroids for, for treatment of inflammation. We do a lot of hip MRI arthrograms because we get that benefit of the pain injection with it, the intraarticular anesthetic to see is the pain coming from the hip joint or not. And then we do some other smaller joints from time to time like ankle, foot, we do tendons and um, sometimes even things like pubic symphysis. So a couple more videos for you here. This one is uh, not on the injection side, but this is a young man, Stanford football player, this is a long time ago, who is, he's straining a muscle here. So he's he's not exactly the world's best DB here, going after the guy, he's like way behind. And you see what happens, there's no contact here, but as he's trying to cover this guy, his left leg, he pulls up lame. He starts, he grabs the back of his biceps there, and um, he's kind of got a mullet thing going on here too, which is kind of fun. Turns out this guy actually played for many years in the NFL, um, not as a DB, but a fullback. Um, but so in, in sports, this is a different patient. This was a 49er patient, but we're good at looking for muscle injuries. And we do a lot of this during the football season, looking for, you know, hamstring, quad strains, all kinds of different strains and sprains. Um, here's the femur. So this is the thigh and here's the femur, the back of the thigh. So this is the biceps femoris muscle, and this is fluid in a tear in the muscle. So sometimes we see a gap in the muscle with distraction. Sometimes you see a little bit of edema from a lower grade strain, things like that. And one of the reasons I show this is because if there's a big collection like this one, you see this was a Stanford football player a couple years ago. This is the rectus femoris. Here's the femur. This is a big blood collection between, between muscles. See this feathery stuff in here? That's edema or some hemorrhage along the muscle. It's not from like a strain or a pull or Whatever. This is from a blunt trauma, like a contusion thing. And so if the collections are big enough, um, and if they're really fluid, then we can drain them. And we drain them because, um, one, they're there. No, uh, because they tend to be painful. Patients, there's pressure in there. And also, if, if, the, if the fluid can be drained out and the muscle or tendons like had a gap in it, we think that getting that gap closer together may help promote the healing process. So again, ultrasound here. So here's the skin surface up here, and there's this collection between the muscles here. You can see this, this thing waggling in there. That's the tip of a spinal needle. And we're basically, in this collection, able to drain out pretty simple fluid, like old blood, like within a day or two. It can be tricky because these things can clot, and you may have undrainable clot. Um, or if it's intramuscular. So we can get some sense with ultrasound whether something is going to be drainable or not. Um, but it's a useful kind of fun thing to be able to do. And I, uh, 
I've done a lot of this in in uh, football athletes, and I wrote a paper on this a couple of years ago of my like 18 years of experience with um, interventions in American football that I can give you the reference to that if you want. Um, this is a bonus video, and this is the last thing. This is me. Uh, this is me getting taken out on the sidelines. Um, so for context. So I get to go to the 49ers games and help with X-ray things. This was a preseason game a couple of years ago. I'm going to be standing down on the sidelines here in a red hat, and um, I'll just let you let you watch. <clears throat> okay, play's almost over. Okay, got him tackled, and it's like, uh oh, dang! <laughs> <laughs> and uh, luckily, I wasn't hurt. But um, this, uh, you know, sort of the play's almost over. And this guy is like coming barreling out. He's 350 pounds or something. And, um, that's the hazards of. Uh, of uh, NFL football. So most of the other guys, like the orthopedists are standing here as well. Each of them has been injured and taken out at least once. So we get very gun shy. And, you know, if you if you watch any football like this, this is like low speed stuff that happened there. So it can be much, much more dramatic. So it was kind of a rite of passage. Uh, we cut the player the next day, though. Um, had nothing to do with me, me getting taken out, but he was he was uh, not that great, you know, uh, so he, he's at the Raiders now. Um, no further comment about the, the different teams across the Bay this season. But um, so I showed some examples, some of the tools of the trade and a little bit of interventions. And just to give you a quick overview of MSK, and we'll sp spend more time on basically whatever you want here um, for a little bit longer. But um, thank you very much for your attention on this part.